I wanted to just um, take the time to read this because I didn't read it in the last one. Um, this was um, put together by the Midwifery Task Force um, when in North America you can study about midwifery history and it's very interesting what can happen. Um, but midwives have had quite a history of some of it very um, oppressive. So there was no legal midwifery when I started my midwifery training in Canada in British Columbia. There was no training available and there was no um, legal midwifery practice. It was considered illegal as opposed to illegal because there really was no, it wasn't illegal, it just wasn't regulated. So I was involved in, in kind of through the pioneering days of midwifery regulation in Canada and watched that process and in that process you know, people had to try to prove to the powers that be that this was a viable alternative for um, safe practice for childbearing families. And um, because of the hate mongering and the um, persecution and um, misunderstanding that has occurred over the years about midwives, um, they, they, they had to go to other countries, so they had to go to Europe and other places, which really is a great thing because Europe um, has been practicing midwifery in many areas of Europe um, and many areas of the world um, practice. Midwifery has, has, has continued to be a practice, but in the United States and Canada, it was not, um, there was a lot of persecution and mid midwives were basically almost became extinct except for the odd grandmother midwife or you know sort of underground I was working underground so to speak in the early days but um, so this particular definition came from the research that they did so I'll read it monitoring physical psychological and social well-being of the mother throughout the childbearing cycle. Providing the mother with individualized education, counseling, with prenatal care, continuous hands-on assistance during labor, so that's the word the continue, continuous continuity, during labor and delivery and postpartum support. And here's uh, the third point, is minimizing techno technological interventions. Now that's the thing we have to really think about when we're looking at this midwifery thing. If uh, w one thing we know about is that money and technology, and we've proven this over the last 50 years, money and technology do not improve outcomes for newborns or mothers. You know, there's, there's a discrepancy in the United States, especially where we're very, um, we're 29th or something on the newbor newborn morbidity rating worldwide which just proves that we, you know, we have a 40% cesarean rate, but in Denmark you have a 4% cesarean rate. So what's wrong? What's, what's different about it? So it's, it's, we really have to think about um, minimizing technolo technology and technological interventions. And of course, identifying and referring women who require obstetrical attention. So just really we're screeners, so we, we, we just work with the average population, which is low risk. If there's a 4% cesarean rate in Denmark, and there's a 40% cesarean rate in the United States, there's something 
there's something wrong there. So really what we do is we work with women that are low risk and we help to, you know, keep them in that low risk category. And then of course we need the other doctors and people if they do go out of that range. There's a place for everything. And that's where those countries like Denmark and, and I think um, England and some of the some of the areas in Europe um, where they do have a, a tradition of midwifery, uh, they generally will go to a midwife unless they have something, some reason why they don't need to, and then they'll go to an obstetrician in some areas. I know it's not like that everywhere, but um, that's really the ideal scenario. The high-risk people just only work with high-risk, and the low-risk, us, we work with low-risk women, and it just works so much better because then you don't have all that anticipation of you know they're, they've spent all this money on these ultrasound machines that they want to use a lot because of that and it's like the research is just mounting against ultrasound I've known it I've known it it's, you know you intuit these things doesn't mean that you know we don't use ultrasound we do but how much we use it and with with what discussion do we use it? It's something to be used with wisdom and prudence and not just haphazardly and too many times. And, you know. So, so that's, and so this is what they um, found with any, any model that used these parameters was proven to reduce the incidence of birth injury uh, trauma to the mother and baby, and C-section rates. So that that's a model of care. That's a that's a pretty traditional midwifery model of care where you are supporting and honoring the physiological normalcy of birth. Birth is a life event. Birth is not a medical event unless it's a high risk woman which should be the very rare exception if we were living the way we need to. And a lot of it is just our, our lifestyle and our daily habits. Lots of stress and lots of anxiety and stuff. So, um, But really respecting the physiological processes and just kind of being a more of a more of a gate keeper and a facilitator as opposed to a I'm gonna make this happen like I, I was explaining it to a friend the other day about who didn't really have a lot of understanding of our system of delivery in, in this country which I think is demeaning of women in many ways and destructive to families because of the way it demeans parents um, autonomy to make decisions for their own families as stewards over their own families, as the number one steward and decision maker in their family. And so what I have really believe in is that families um, are the center of this experience and we are coming into their experience. And even if it's in a hospital or a birth center or whatever, that still, that's the energy of it. It's not like if, you know, the average typical hospital, you know, you're kind of going into somebody else's world. It's just the reality. And sometimes it can be really good. So I've been in some amazing places. One in Hawaii where it was a nurse midwife who basically was doing home births in the hospital in a little community in the middle of Oahu. It was just a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. So, you know, it can be done. Um, one of the things, I'll just tell you one funny thing so it's not too boring, all this stuff, but she said um, one of the things she'd tell all these native Hawaiian women who didn't always have um, a very didn't always have a lot of education and they really didn't understand about and they kind of were used to 
traditions where you know you try to make it happen earlier and not, don't wait. One of the things that we know is that when we try to force something, well, that was the story I was going to tell you that I told um, a friend that it's like taking a little flower, you know, a beautiful rose, and when you just wait for the petals to open naturally, it's just so beautiful and amazing. But you have to be patient. You can't force it. You have to wait until it opens. And that's what a birthing room is. It's just like a flower in bloom. You can bud. And just let that bud open on its own. I mean, we can help it a little bit along, give it a lot of water, sunshine, all the good things that, the, that roses and babies need. Sunshine and good food and lots of loving, good, relaxed energy. So... So really just, um, you know, the story I was going to tell you. Okay, so we told you the story about the flower and then about the, oh, the, the, the um, certified nurse midwife in Hawaii. Yes, so she, she would tell her, her ladies, her, um, her Hawaiian ladies, that she, she said, you know, it's like if you pick a papaya off the tree, and when it's not ready, what's it going to taste like? You know? But you wait till it's juicy, plump, orangey, yummy, dripping with juice and sweetness. That's what you are. Your tummy's like a big papaya. Let it ripen on its own. <laughs> so, um, so the midwifery model of care can be practiced anywhere in a hospital, in a birth center at home, or in a post-disaster tent, like Robin Limbs. Um, she does post-disaster support, and they do physiologic birth in these post-disaster tents. And they have a 100% breastfeeding rate, which is a miracle, because what do you think happens to a baby that doesn't breastfeed in a post-disaster setting or a low-resource setting? Well, what happens is they have a 300 times higher risk of death. And that's a serious thing. So, you know, the midwifery model of care Respecting physiologic birth creates good outcomes. And that's what I believe is the midwifery model of care. You can call yourself whatever you want, but if you're not lowering the intervention rate and the infection rate and the and in creating something more um, empowering for that family where they actually come out of it feeling like it was their experience and they really felt like they had a say in what happened and it was enriching and they came out better for it you know in, in a lot of ways and learned something from it you know and 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 just felt like they were listened to they were honored it's their experience it's their birth it's their baby and I think that's one of the important aspects of the midwifery model of care is acknowledging and honoring that family system that you are a servant in that family system and you still have your boundaries and your your, your skills because that's who you are that's why you're there you have that training so the relationship between the client and the midwife is vital that they trust you, and that's a built relationship, you know, as you go along, you build your trust. Um, and so, just, I think just explore what you believe is the middle, uh, is the midwifery model of care in your area. You can do a little bit of research on that. And then, um, if you want to see some other models of midwifery, you can look up the North American registration of midwifery of midwives and that uh, is norm.org
and there's quite a lot of information in there about the need for free model of care and about informed decision making and about um, different aspects of mental free continuity of care and whatnot. So just um, we will talk a little bit about it in the videos in the in the clips and then you can also do research in your own particular area and all the best to you in that um, discovery process. Bless you.